Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. The time is three minutes after six Eastern Daylight Time. We're coming up on T minus 32 minutes, 21 seconds. Mark. To facilitate the broadcast media, we will proceed each announcement with a five second tone followed by a one second pause. Anyone who's not been furnished with a press kit can pick one up at the information trailer. At the present time, all systems are go, all lights are green. To review the morning for you, at T-minus 8 hours, 5 minutes, Launch Complex 39 was cleared and we began to load liquid propellant into the launch vehicle. At T-minus 4 hours, 30 minutes, Colonel Charles Brubaker, the command pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Willis, and Commander John Walker were awakened by Dr. Roger Burroughs, the flight surgeon. They were given a final physical examination and pronounced all fit. The crew then had a breakfast consisting of half a grapefruit, a 10-ounce steak, 12 ounces of orange juice, two eggs, and toast. The crew is now in the gantry access arm where they're preparing to enter the spacecraft. We're at T-minus 30 minutes and counting, and this is Capricorn Control. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, horse. Are we late? Traffic was terrible. I see you're all in good spirits. Have you done the EDS test yet? You're almost completed. You want us to enter? In a moment. What's up? I'm not very good at things like this. I've known you, especially Colonel Brubaker, for some time. What you're about to do today, I've spent my life. I'd just like you to know that I feel that all I've ever worked for, it has meaning today, and I'm very proud. Proud of the program, and proud of what I've been able to contribute in some small way, and proud of you. I'd like for you to take this Bible with you. From me. From all of us. Why, Horace, I don't know what to say. Well, try saying nothing for a change. Horace. Thank you. We'd be honored to take this with us. Well, gentlemen, let's go to Mars. This is Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. We're now at T-minus 21 minutes and counting. The wives of the flight crew are here at the gate and will be flown back to Houston following launch. Good morning, Congressman Pinker. We've reserved three of the best seats for you and for General Enders, right next to the Vice President. Is he here yet? No, sir, he's due any moment. Asshole probably thinks they'll delay the launch for him. Someone should tell him this is not a bridge opening. I hope you and Mrs. Pico will be very comfortable. The agency would like you to have these commemorative binoculars to help you watch the launch and to remember this day. Ah, it's very nice. Look at mm -hmm. it. Have a date, Capricorn One emblem, and go. Very nice, honest. I'm glad you like them. We'll need another pair for my wife. I, I beg your pardon? Uh, don't make a fuss. This is all right. I said we'll need another pair for my wife. It's really not necessary. Here, Emily, take mine. I really won't need them. Yeah, I really don't. Congressman Pico, there's only a limited I'm, I'm amount. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear what you said. Would you mind repeating it, please? Oh, there's no problem. I'll get another pair right away. Very thoughtful. This is Capricorn Control. We're at T-minus 15 minutes and still counting. All systems are go. All lights are green. Mission Control has reported the spacecraft is now on full external power. The launch vehicle will transfer to full internal power at T-minus 50 seconds. Both Ascension and Canary tracking stations report clear reception. The prime recovery ship in the event of a terminated flight will be the USS Kitty Hawk, which is located 350 nautical miles south-southeast of Bermuda. This is Capricorn Control. Hello, Emily. How are you? Phyllis? Hello, Hollis. Emily. Nice to see you. Glad to see you. Hollis, how are you? Very well, Mr. Vice President. How is the president today? Oh, just fine, thank you, Hollis. And he asked me to personally express his regrets at being unable to attend this launch. However, there were some very pressing matters that needed his attention in Washington. Like getting reelected. Mr. Vice President, I hope you and Mrs. Price will be very comfortable. The agency would like you to have these commemorative binoculars to help you watch the launch and to remember this day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice. What is your name, sir? Hughes, sir. Mark Hughes. You learn pretty quick. You'll do all right. Thank you, sir. We're at T-minus 10 minutes and counting. Stage one is green. Stage two is green. Stage two is green. Malfunction detect system on second panel. Roger, MDS on second panel. Capricorn one, we confirm 
TARS and MDS, you are green on move. You will go for inertial guidance and ohms checks. Roger, Houston. Gentlemen, we're ready to close the hatch. Anybody want to get out? This is your last chance. Hey, R, is this Mars the red one or the green one? I forgot. Four billion dollars to put crazy people into space. Keep us off the streets. Colonel Brubaker has reaffirmed the completion of the EDS test checks. Mission control reports all systems are go, all lights are green. Dr. James Kellaway, director of the manned space program, is in Houston at this moment. He is in full voice contact with the flight crew. Landing module OI shutdown. OI shutdown complete. Capricorn 1, you should have full CM internal power. Roger, Houston, we have internal power. Vehicle final status check. Begin status check. TLR pressure reading is 45.2. Roger, Houston. Roger, Capricorn, we copy. Crew, would you and your men please follow me? Jerry, what the hell is this? There's no time to explain. Please follow me. Are you nuts? I said there's no time to explain. This is an emergency. Please follow me, now! Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. The space vehicle final checks have been completed. The access arms are swinging into final retract position. The destruct systems are now fully armed. TLR pressure reading is 45.2. Roger, Houston, 45.2. The flight crew has completed the final launch vehicle range safety checks. At T minus 50 seconds, the launch vehicle will be on full internal power. That begins the actual launch sequence. The weather is reported good, scattered clouds at 10,000 feet. All systems are go, all lights are green. We're at T minus three minutes, six seconds, mark. The launch officer is given a go to begin the firing command automatic sequence. From now until T minus 50 seconds, that system is preset. Initial stage thruster check is normal. Roger, you are coming up on T minus one minute, 30 seconds. The final range safety checks are completed. The launch safety officer reports all systems are nominal and we are go at this time. The launch escape tower is now fully armed. In the event of an abort, the tower will carry the command module away from the launch vehicle and will activate a system of drogue chutes at 10,000 feet. The flight crew reports all guidance and navigation systems are functioning properly. The range safety officer reports all tracking stations are operational. This is Capricorn Control. It's that big, tall, white thing over there. Can't miss it. This is Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. We're at T minus one minute and still counting. All systems are go, all lights are green. We should have launch vehicle power transfer right about now. Capricorn user ALCS. Roger Houston, we read nominal ALCS. Roger Capricorn, we We're at T minus 30 seconds. At the present time, all systems are go, all lights are green. Your man might be more comfortable than these. We are T minus 18 seconds from liftoff. We T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight. We have ignition. Six, five. We have outboard engines. Three. We have inboard engines. One, zero. We have a launch commit. We have a liftoff at 35 minutes after the hour. Roger, we are starting yaw. Roger, Engine roll program complete. The vehicle is on target, running smoothly. Looking good, Capricorn. We are coming up on T plus 40 seconds. Staging should be in the next 30 seconds. Outboard cutoff should be in 10 seconds. Obico, Capricorn. Roger, Houston. We have outboard cutoff. Obico at T plus 2 minutes, 29 seconds. We're go for staging. You are go for staging, Capricorn. Roger, Houston. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We read staging. We copy. We have separation. It's confirmed. We have separation at T plus 2 minutes, 43 seconds. S2 ignition. We have S2. We have second stage ignition. S2 ignition at T plus 2 minutes, 46 seconds. The vehicle is 47 miles downrange. Altitude 43 miles. Velocity 6,100 miles per hour. 
Mr. Vice President, please give my regards to the President. Oh, yes, I'll be very happy to do that, Hollis. I uh, hope that whatever problems he found so important not to be here today, I hope he has considerable success with them. Well, that's really very sporting of you, Hollis. I'm sure the President will be very pleased to learn of your support. The President would get considerable more of my humble support if he would only be a little more helpful with this program here. Now, Hollis, you know the President is most interested in this program. I am most interested in a lot of things, including my wife's bridge game. That is not the same as supporting something. Hollis, there are a number of people who feel that we have problems right here on Earth that merit our attention before we spend billions of dollars on outer space. There are a number of people who feel that there are no more pressing problems in our declining position in world leadership. It was wonderful seeing you again, Hollis. The pleasure was all mine, Mr. Vice President. This is Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. We are at T plus two hours, 16 minutes into the flight. The spacecraft is now in an elliptical orbit with an apogee of 141 nautical miles and a perigee of 122 nautical miles. Mission Control reports full voice contact with the flight crew. This is Capricorn Control. Welcome, Colonel Brubaker. Could you please come with us? I'm not going anywhere until somebody tells us what the hell's going on. Everything will be explained to you. Bullshit. I want to know right now. Colonel, I know this sounds strange. We are all working for the same thing. We are not your enemy. wait here. I suppose you're wondering why I called you all here. Good morning. Hi there, Dr. Calloway. Nice to see you. A funny thing happened on the way to Mars. Well, why don't you all sit down? Okay. Here it is. I have to start by saying that if there was any other way, if there was even the slight chance of another alternative, I would give anything not to be here with you now. Anything. Brew, how long have we known each other? Sixteen years. That's how long. Sixteen years. You should have seen yourself then. You looked like you just walked out of a Wheaties box. And me, all sweaty palmed and deadly serious. I told everybody about this dream I had of conquering the new frontier, and they all looked at me like I was nuts. You looked at me and said yes. I remember when you told me Kay was pregnant. We went out and got crocked. I remember when Charles was born. We went out and got crocked again. The two of us, Captain Terrific and the Mad Doctor talking about reaching the stars, and the bartender telling us maybe we'd had enough. Sixteen years. And then Armstrong stepped out on the moon, and we cried. We were so proud. Willis, you and Walker, you came in about then, both bright and talented wise asses, looked at me in my wash and wear shirt, carrying on this hot love affair with my slide rule, and even you were caught up in what we'd done. I remember when Glenn made his first orbit in Mercury. They put up television sets in Grand Central Station, and tens of thousands of people missed their trains to watch. You know, when Apollo 17 landed on the moon, people were calling up the networks and bitching because reruns of I Love Lucy were canceled. Reruns, for Christ's sake. I can understand if it was a new Lucy show. I mean, what the hell is a walk on the moon? But reruns. Oh, jeez. 
And then suddenly everybody started talking about how much everything cost. Was it really worth 20 billion to go to another planet? What about cancer? What about the slums? How much does it cost? How much does any dream cost, for Christ's sake? Since when is there an accountant for ideas? You know who was at the launch today? Not the president, the vice president, that's who. The vice president and his plump wife. The president was busy. He's not busy. He's just a little bit scared. He sat there two months ago and put his feet up on Woodrow Wilson's desk. And he said, Jim, make it good. Congress is on my back. They're looking for a reason to cancel the program. We can't afford another screw-up. Make it good. You have my every good wish. His every good wish. I got his sanctimonious vice president. That's what I got. And so there we are. After all those hopes and all that dreaming, he sits there with those flags behind his chair and tells me we can't afford a screw-up. And guess what? We had a screw-up. A first-class, bona fide, made-in-America screw-up. The good people from Con Amalgamate delivered a life support system cheap enough so they could make a profit on the deal. Works out fine for everybody. Con Amalgamate makes money. We have our life support system. Everything's peachy. Except they made a little bit too much profit. We found out two months ago, it won't work. You guys would all be dead in three weeks. It's as simple as that. So all I have to do is report that and scrub the mission. Congress has its excuse. The president still has his desk and we have no more program. What's 16 years, your actual drop in the bucket? All right, that's the end of the speech. Now we're getting to what they call the moment of truth. Come with me. I want to show you something. Roger, Houston. TMI burn time will be five minutes, 45 seconds. Roger, Kevin. Delta V burn time, 3.3 seconds. There's a door here. I'm going to open it and walk into another area. If you follow me, you'll see a bit more. I'll answer some questions and... We're going to... Why don't you just follow me? Houston is monitoring the actual flight. All the telemetry is coming from the uh, command module. So are your voices and the medical data. We recorded everything from the practice simulations. They don't know. All we need from you is the actual television transmissions during the flight and the Mars landing. That's all. Just the television transmissions. That's all. Just the television transmissions. We inserted a change in the onboard computer so the spacecraft will land 200 miles off target when it returns to Earth. You'll be flown to an island near that point. From there, you'll be transferred to a helicopter. The helicopter will fly you to the space capsule and you'll be put inside. It'll take the recovery forces a minimum of an hour and a half to reach the splashdown site. By then, you'll be inside the capsule. When the prime recovery carrier arrives, they'll find you inside the capsule and take you out of the spacecraft. You thought of everything. I don't know. I hope so. Of course, you're sure we'll go along, right? No, I'm not. What if we say no? I don't know. Don't say no. When does Alan Funt come running in and tell us we're all on candid camera? Oh, Jesus, you think I like this? 
You think I really believe I'm standing here in this craziness telling you about patching and tape recordings and telemetry and an island 200 miles from the target zone? I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing either. I just care so goddamn much. I think it's worth it. I'm not even sure of that. I just think it. I think I'm gonna throw up. Well, that'll solve everything. What's this all gonna solve? It'll keep something alive that shouldn't die. Before you all begin to moralize, you take a look around. You look at what we've done and how much more we can do. You look at what we've meant to this country. Nobody gives a crap about anything anymore. People close their garages and triple lock their doors, they hide under the beds. They're even afraid to turn on their television sets for fear of what they might find out in the evening news. There's nothing more to believe in. Now, you want to blow this whole thing wide open? God knows what it might do to everybody. I'm sorry. I'm so goddamn sorry. I just don't know what else to do. I'm hanging on by my fingernails, just like everybody else. Go on. You, you want to be the ones who give everyone another reason to give up? Go on. This is really wonderful. But we go along with you and lie our asses off in the world of truth and ideals is uh, protected. But we don't want to take part in some giant ripoff of yours, and somehow or other we're managing to ruin the country. You're pretty good, Jim. I'll give you that. No, no, no. You're twisting my words. Don't sell yourself short. Don't sell the program short. Don't oversell it. I'm not so sure that canceling a flight or uh, cutting off appropriations means America folds up. It's not as simple as that, and you know it. I don't know it. If the only way to keep something alive is to become everything I hate, I don't know if it's worth keeping it alive. Please, Brew, don't talk like that. What the hell's the matter with you? Please, Brew, don't talk like that. I don't think this is right. All the rest is bullshit. You have to help. What do you mean, I have to? You have to help. Well, what if I don't? Please, don't put me in a corner. You're crazy. You know that? You know that? You're crazy. You've got us in the middle of this nut house, and you don't want to be put in a corner? Your families. What about our families? Please, you have to help. What about our families? You have to help. Oh, shit, this thing is out of my hands. You think it's all a couple of loony scientists. It's not. It's bigger. There are people out there, forces out there, who have a lot to lose. They're grown-ups. It's gotten too big. It's in the hands of grown-ups. What about our families? They're flying back from the Cape to Houston. They're all together on the plane. No, you're not serious. Please. Bro, don't make me. You son of a bitch, tell me! They're on the plane together, goddammit! You want it in writing? There's a device. It's on the plane, too. There's some people, if I don't give them the all-clear signal, they'll explode it. Don't you understand? It doesn't have to be like this. You have to help. It's gotten out of control. It's too big. You wouldn't. Tell me you wouldn't. I can't tell you that, Brew. This coffee is horrible. It's not that bad. It is. It's that bad. Don't drink it. I'm always unwrapping things. I wake up and take the cellophane off the drinking glass, the soaps in a Holiday Inn wrapper. Even the toilet has a paper band on it with a nice little note from the hotel saying they put the band on the toilet for my protection. I'm always afraid that if I stay in bed too long, the maid's going to walk in the room and put a paper band around me and the bedspread. I don't mind. You wait. After a while, you won't know what city you're in. I defy anyone to tell me the difference between the Holiday Inn in Houston and the Holiday Inn in Cincinnati. The rooms are the same, the music in the elevators is the same, even the ladies with too much makeup in the coffee shop are the same. You never know where you are until after breakfast when you read the paper. I don't mind it. Well, I don't mind it that much either. It's just that I would like it all to be with someone I care for, someone I could share it with. Bullshit. You're so damn cynical. I'm not cynical. It's just that your act could use a little polish. What do you mean by that? Well, Liz Haller, for starters, it was the California primary. I believe you used the one about both of you being witnesses to the unfolding of history. You have to admit that's a little better than soap wrappers. Do you think all I want to do is jump you? Yes. 
You would know sincerity if it ran over you. Not if you were driving it. I'm glad I'm not like you. I have better legs. Okay, I give up. Don't give up so easily. Just change your approach. What approach would you like? How about something like, um, I would like to jump you. Think that would work? Stands a better chance than wanting to share a meaningful life together. I would like to jump you. Go jump yourself. Hello. I'm sorry that you have to wait outside the house all day like this. There's not much that I can say except that I'm very excited and proud. Everything seems to be going smoothly. Dr. Kellaway called to say that Brew and the crew were in excellent spirits. How has all this disrupted your family routine? Terrific question. Shove it. Well, well, the children will continue to go to school and we'll try to maintain a normal existence. Um, I suppose that's all that I have to say. Thank you all for coming. I just came out to say hello and go back inside now. Thank you. Goodbye. Yes, Elliot. I wonder if I could talk to you for a moment. What is it? Well, <clears throat> there's something. I have a problem, sir. Oh, are you feeling all right? Oh, yes, sir. It's the readout. What about the readout? Well, I, I just can't figure something out. Well, perhaps I can be of some help. Well, I hope so. See, I, I ran a check on the transmission on my own, on the signals. On your own? <laughs> yes, sir. I like your dedication. The readout. The television signals are coming in ahead of the spacecraft signals. It's like they're closer or something, much closer. No, that's not possible. There must be some malfunction in your equipment. Well, I don't think so, Dr. Bergen. You see, I double-checked that console. Which console are you on? The 36, sir. Well, that's the answer. We've been having some problems with the circuitry on 36. We've had trouble with it before. I'll make sure it's repaired, and uh, thank you for bringing the problem to my attention. You show initiative. I like that. Five minutes from landing. The wives of the flight crew arrived at Mission Control at 2.31 Eastern Daylight Time. In just a few minutes, we should be receiving a signal from the spacecraft. It's important to know that it takes 21 minutes for the signal from Mars to reach Earth. We have no way of communicating with Capricorn 1, and what we will see actually happened 21 minutes ago. This is Capricorn Control. We're getting something now. We are changing to a secondary frequency. Houston, this is Capricorn 1. CMLM separation was nominal. I have CM visual contact through the port window. Delta V burn time, 3.3 seconds. 3.3 seconds burn is correct. We should be hearing from the CM soon. Houston, this is Just Capricorn wait. CM. I see the LM. Five minutes after the landing, that asshole Price will be calling to tell me how pleased the president is. If our data is correct, their altitude is 2.2 miles, pitch angle 20 degrees, vertical descent 44.6 feet per second. We have passed located. Altitude 950 feet. Looking good. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. 9. 8. 7. 6. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Houston, this is Capricorn One. We have landed. Yeah! 
Hello, Mr. Vice President. Yes, it's wonderful, isn't it? Proud moment for all Americans. You can tell the President that's very gracious of him. I appreciate it, I really do. Thank you. And my very best to your lovely wife. Yes. Goodbye. Asshole. Dr. Kellaway, I wonder if I could speak to you for a moment. Certainly, Elliot. What seems to be the problem? Well, I just can't figure something out, sir. What is that? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but it's in the readout. I spoke to Dr. Bergen about it a long time ago, and he said it was in the console. I'd like you to take a look at it. What console are you on? Telemetry is a 36. Oh, yes, Dr. Bergen told me about that. We had that console repaired. I know, sir. It's just I keep on having the same readouts. What readout? Well, sir, I uh, ran a program on my own just to check something, and the readout's different. You ran your own program? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, I don't think it's the console. Well, we'll have it shut down, and I'll see that it's serviced. Thank you, Elliot, for bringing the matter to my attention. You're welcome, sir. Cunningham, Capricorn Control. The flight director advises that the LM crew has been given a go for the first EVA on the Martian surface. Because the time delay would make a conversation impossible, the crew has taken a pre-recorded message from the President of the United States along with them. This is Capricorn Control. Houston, we are activating the camera. Roger, Capricorn. Houston, you should have a picture now. We have a pretty good picture now. Houston, I am out of the hatch. I'm on the ladder. Houston, the suit is functioning. The ladder is steady. I am three steps from the bottom. I'm two steps from the bottom. Houston, I'm on the bottom step. Houston, I am going to set foot on the surface. Ready, slow mo. I take this step in the journey of peace. Hey! Houston, I am on the surface. Roger, Capricorn. We copy. I'm starting to walk now. Houston, the surface is solid. Visibility is good. I'm walking toward the camera. The footing is solid. The surface seems powdery. I'm picking up the camera now. I have the camera. The picture will get shaky for a while. The footing is good. Houston, I am setting the camera down now. The rocks seem very porous. Houston, I am outside the hatch. Houston, I am on the ladder. Ready, slow mo. Houston, I'm stepping onto the surface. Take slow mo. Houston, I'm on the surface. We are going to set the flag on the surface. We do not claim this planet in the name of America. We claim it in the name of all the people of the planet Earth. We hope that our visit will increase the understanding 
of the human race. And Walker should be activating the tape soon with the pre-recorded message from the president. Houston, I am starting the tape. To the men of Capricorn One, I bring you greetings from your fellow Americans and all of the citizens of the world. You are so far away. It takes light more than 20 minutes to reach you from here. One could say not only light, one could say time. You are in another time from us. The future, we will never be the same. For this moment, more than any moment in our history, has made all of the people in the world realize that we are part of a planet, that is part of a system, that is part of a universe. We are a small, energetic species, capable of pettiness, yet capable of brilliance. We know how bad we can be. Now you, the men of Capricorn One, have shown us how wonderful we can be by showing us how high we can reach. You have crossed the last great frontier, and you have shown us what we are, people of different colors and religions and ideologies, however, a single people. You are the basic truth in us. You are the reality. We will never let you down. And we will always be grateful. I have decided after careful deliberation and painful soul searching to give you an opportunity to win your $50 back. I don't feel like playing. Eight ball, five dollars a game. I don't feel like it. Ten dollars a game. I'm serious. So am I. I'll even let you break. How much more serious can a person be? Are you drunk? I knew there was a reason I was feeling this good. I need a drink. Underneath that wash and wear shirt, you have some heart. It may be sanferized, but it's a heart. Marty? I must have been drunk. Hard day at the office, do you want to talk about it? Did you break your slide rule? I'm not really sure. I ran a check on my own on the transmission signals. The numbers came up screwy, so I told Dr. Bergen about it. It was like he was pissed at me for running a check. He said it must be a console malfunctioning, so I told Dr. Kellaway about it. He said the same thing. Big deal. What did you expect, a merit badge? I guess so. They must know what they're doing. Those numbers couldn't have been right anyway. No way. Well, if you know the numbers couldn't have been right, why the hell are you so upset? It was the way they reacted. No double check or anything. They looked at me like I was a kid and offered me a cookie. What were the numbers? I have to admit it is ridiculous. Good. Let's play pool. Those signals couldn't have come from 300 miles. Which signals? The television transmissions. I think I just sobered up. Would you tell me what you just told me again? Hey, Caulfield. Telephone. Hello. Yes, this is Caulfield. What? I'm sorry. You'll have to speak more clearly. I think we have a bad connection or something. I can't hear you. Who? I don't understand what you want. Look, if you call the assignment desk, they'll be glad to send someone over to cover that for you. Yes, ask for the assignment desk. Assignment, that's right. You're welcome. still send out for pizza. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do what? Tomorrow I'm not going to sit in this thing and talk to my wife and tell her everything's going fine. I'm not going to do it. 
I try. I get two little kids with big bright eyes. And I used to tell them their daddy was going to make them proud of him. Like he was of them. And now I got to go home. I got to kiss them and I got to look in their eyes and tell them I really did this. I don't know, maybe that's better than going home and telling them I really didn't do it. I wish I knew what was right, I really don't. We've been sitting around here for months, telling their lies to them. And I don't want to do it anymore. Look, so we're going to blow the whole thing tomorrow, on national TV. Then what have we done? We'd screw up a lot of people's dinner. We've already screwed ourselves. Okay, so what do we accomplish by screwing everybody else? He's got a point there, you know. We went along with this because of you. You and our family. Now you want to go out for some terrific blaze of glory, and we get pulverized in the process. And our families. What about our families? I know. Me, Dr. Calloway. Why all of a sudden are we standing up for the bad guys and you're on the side of truth and justice? We may have a problem with Brubecker tomorrow. I wish I had the words. Damn the words! These people, they're capable of anything. And we got our families out there. Now we're in this thing, and I think we're in too deep to stop now. No one of us is going to decide. It's got to be all of us. Operator, I'm trying a number now for over an hour and it's busy. Would you kindly check to see if it's out of order? I know you don't do that. Yes, it's an emergency. Thank you. 8733657. No, 3657, Mr. Elliot Witter. Out of order? Thank you very much, Officer. This is Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. We're at T plus 223 days, 6 hours, 32 minutes. All systems are go, all lights are green. We're awaiting the start of the final television transmissions from the command module on its return to Earth. This transmission is specifically a conversation between the crew and their wives. This is the first time the crew has been close enough to Earth to make normal conversation feasible. This is Capricorn Control. Capricorn 1, this is Houston. Capricorn 1, this is Houston. Roger, Houston, this is Capricorn 1. Houston, do you have a picture? Roger, Capricorn, we have a picture. We have three anxious ladies here who would like to talk to you. Roger, Houston. We sure like to talk to them. Okay, go ahead, but keep it short. Remember, this is long distance. Jack? Jack, it's Betty. Hey, Betty, how are you? You look fine. You know, we can't see you up here, but you sure sound terrific. I miss you. So do the kids. Thank you. I miss them, too, more than you all know. Peter? It's Sharon. I told you never to call me here. Uh, are you feeling well? I'm feeling very well. How's Sandy? She's got the part of Wendy in her school play. They're doing Peter Pan. That's terrific. You sound so close. It's hard to believe you really are that far away in space. It's hard for me to believe it, too. Brew? Hello, King. We're all so proud of you. Can you hear me, Brew? Yes. I'm not sure, Brew Baker. Keep watching. Brew, I have a surprise for you. What? <clears throat> I said I have a surprise for you. What is it? Charles wrote a composition in school, and he won an award. May I read it to you? Brew, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, please read it to me. It doesn't look good. Do you want me to cut the transmission? Not until I tell you. My Father, by Charles Brubaker, Jr. 
My father is far away from me now. He is flying to Mars. I miss him very much. I always miss him when he goes away. I'm not sad, though. I used to be sad when he went away. One day he told me something. He said that people can't live only for themselves. He said that he was trying to do something that would be good for everybody. I know that is what he is doing now. He is doing something for everybody to give them a better life. That means he is doing something for me too. So even though he is far away, he is thinking about me and I am with him. That is why I'm not sad. That is why I'm so proud of my dad. And I love him so much. Kate. What is it? There's something I, I want to say. I know this hasn't been easy for you and the kids. I want you to know I love you. Tell Charles, thanks for the composition, please. I will. But when I get back, I'm gonna take him to Yosemite again. Like last summer. I will. Time's up, gentlemen. Roger. The next time we see, you'll be on the way home. Uh, Roger. Well done, Capricorn. Witter in, tell him it's Caulfield. Who? Witter, Elliot Witter. There's no one here by that name. You must have the wrong apartment. Well, this is apartment 228, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you probably have the wrong building. You know, they all sort of look alike. Yeah, that's right. This is 4311 Claridge, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Elliot Witter lives at 4311 Claridge in apartment 228. Is this a joke? Look, I've been here a million times. Elliot's a friend of mine, and he lives in this apartment. Look, mister, whoever you are, I'm cleaning an oven. It's my oven. It's in my kitchen, in my apartment. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to get back to it. Wait a minute, just wait. Look, I'm not a crazy person, and I'm not a mugger. I'm looking for my friend, and he lives in this apartment. I swear it. Would you get your foot out of my door, or I'm going to call the police? Now, I don't think this is funny anymore. Wait, I can prove I've been here before. I know this apartment. Get out of here, or do I have to call the police?
Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. We are 259 days, 14 hours, 12 minutes into the flight. All systems are nominal, all lights are green. The prime recovery ship, the USS Oriskany, is in position. An on-target landing should result in recovery time of 18 minutes from splashdown to the opening of the hatch. After the crew delivers its speech on the Oriskany deck and is welcomed aboard by Captain Earl Moore, they'll be taken below deck for a medical debriefing. Tonight at 8 o'clock Pacific Daylight Time, the crew will attend a victory banquet topped by a special dessert, a 40-foot red cake depicting the Martian surface. We are 23 minutes, 12 seconds from the beginning of the reentry phase. This is Capricorn Control. We have a chopper waiting on the island to take to the spacecraft when it splashes down. It'll take the Oriskany about an hour and a half to reach you, so there won't be any rush. All lights are green. Roger. All green. Separation thruster checklist. Separation thruster checklist. Outboard thrusters. Outboard thrusters are. Inboard thrusters. Inboard thrusters. How are we doing? Separation you might have a slight problem, sir. Are. What is it? They're a little bit off target. Checklist. How far off? Roger. As much as 200 miles. That far? It could take up to an hour and a half for the recovery forces to reach them. Roger. Keep me posted. Yes, sir. Six, five, four, three, two. Capricorn One, this is Houston. Capricorn One, we show red on the heat shield. Do you copy? Capricorn One, this is Houston. We show red on the heat shield. Do you read? Capricorn One, this is Houston. We show red on the heat shield. Do you copy? Capricorn One, this is Houston. Capricorn One, we show red on the heat shield. Do you copy? Capricorn One, Dr. this Kellaway? is Houston. Capricorn One, this is Houston. Do you read? Capricorn One, this is Houston. Capricorn One, we show red on the heat shield. Do you copy? Capricorn One, this is Houston. 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 Capricorn, we show a red light on the heat shield. Do you copy? Capricorn One, this is Houston. This is Paul Cunningham, Capricorn Control. We are advised that there appears to be a malfunction. We do not know what the problem is. We will keep you advised. This is Capricorn Control. Charles, take Sandy and go inside. Mom, Charles, go inside now. Mom. Charles, I said right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a brief statement, and then I will answer your questions. It must have been re-entry. Something went wrong during re-entry. Why haven't they told us anything? They don't want us to know what went wrong. What went wrong? Where the hell is Callaway? Where the hell are we? At T plus 259 days, 15 hours, 11 minutes in the flight of Capricorn 1, which is two minutes, 18 seconds after interface. The heat shield warning light on the mission control monitoring panel turned red. We are dead. What? We're dead. Shit, I was such a terrific guy. We tried to establish radio contract, contact with the spacecraft and we were unsuccessful. If it landed off course, why haven't they said anything to us? And if it never landed, either the heat shield separated or the chutes never opened. Either way, we are dead. The heat shield evidently separated from the command module. And as you know, the heat shield is the only protection the module has 
against the heat buildup on re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. The spacecraft disintegrated within 12 seconds after the loss of the heat shield. Right now, Kellaway is making a speech about what brave, wonderful guys we were. I cannot adequately describe how we feel. These men were an integral part of a family here in the program. Anybody ever sees us again and the whole thing falls apart. Simple as that. They can't afford to have us around. That is the end of my statement. Have you spoken to the families? Yes. I don't know how we have a lot of choice in this matter. I say we get the hell out of here. Anybody disagree? When was the last time the heat shield was checked? All during the re-entry phase, there were a series of status checks. All of them gave us every indication the shield was in place. No, I have not spoken to the president yet, but I'm sure I will very soon. I'd like to say that the president has been a constant source of encouragement to all of us in the program. This mission meant as much to him as it did to us. Do you think this will end the manned space program? I don't know. can't reach that far without stumbling somewhere along the way. That doesn't mean that your goal isn't worthwhile. So many people have given so much. In 1967, we had the uh, Apollo 1 fire. But we didn't just give up even though we were crushed. We went on as they would have wanted us to. Remarkable men have given their lives in an effort to widen the horizons of their species. They died striving for a goal. Tell me. I ask you, I ask all of you here, you be the ones to tell me, how could we best serve these men? By giving up on their dream? By saying that it was all for nothing? You give me the answer. That was the left gear we lost. See if you can retract the other one. Have you any idea where we are? No. Which direction are we at? West. Once we hit the coast, we'll go north. All we've got to do is get to any city, any place there are people. A newspaper, a television station, any place we can show up and be seen, then it's over. I'm not sure it's exactly over. Our families, our kids, they think we're dead. I wonder. When we show up, when everybody finds out, I wonder if they'll be happy. Maybe it'd be better for them if we were dead. Oh, Christ. Fuel, there's no goddamn fuel. I 
told you never to take a trip without checking the tank. What about reserve? You are on reserve. That's great. I'll start to circle, see if you can find a level area. There. Over there, beyond those cliffs. Are you sure you know how to land this thing? Full flaps. I think we're on Mars. We got about 20 minutes head start on him. It's not gonna be hard to spot this plane from the air. We got two choices. Either we stick together or we split up and go in different directions. Hey, I just found a survival kit in here. A can of water each. Flare each. John, you take the flint. Peter and I'll split up the matches. Anybody want the gun? I'd shoot my foot. I'd shoot his foot. You take the knife. Remember, if any of us gets caught, or he can't make it, shoot off a flare. So the others will know. I'll continue west. John, you go north. Peter, you go south. We came from the east, so we know that's the wrong way. There's not a lot of time. There's too much to say, so let's go. If any of us makes it. Well. I ever tell you the one about the guy who had a job giving enemas to elephants? And... <sighs> Thanks. You ever hear it? You can tell me about it when we get home. Mr. Knox, sir, let's do tricks with bricks and blocks, sir. Let's do tricks with chicks and clocks, sir. Blocks? Look, blocks. Right. There are the blocks, and those are the... Clocks. Right. First, I'll make a quick trick brick stack. Then I'll make a quick trick block stack. You can make a quick trick chick stack. You can make a quick trick clock stack. Chicks. And? Clocks. And here's a new trick, Mr. Knox. Socks on chicks and chicks on fox. Fox on clocks, on bricks and blocks. 
bricks and blocks on Fox and Box? Now we come to ticks and talk, sir. Try to say this, Mr. Knox, sir. Clocks, clocks on fixed tick, clocks on Knox talk. Clocks, clocks, clocks. Right, Sandy, very good. Six, sick, bricks, take. I'd like to see Mrs. Brubaker. My name is Caulfield. Miss Brubaker isn't seeing anyone at the moment. I telephoned this morning. I believe I'm expected. What was that name again? Caulfield. Robert Caulfield. Oh, yes. Miss Brubaker is expecting you. She's out on the patio. It's right through there. Thank you. Mrs. Brubaker. Mr. Caulfield. Sit down, please. Uh, Mrs. Brubaker, first of all, I'd like to say I'm really sorry. Everyone is I so... I know, and I appreciate it. Please, don't be too uncomfortable with me. I don't know that I could put up with that right now. I understand that, that you think you're interrupting me, and you are, but I welcome the interruption. You called and said it was something important. What is it? Mrs. Brubaker, it may not be important to you. I'm looking for something that may be important to me. It's personal. You're a reporter, aren't you? Yes. As I told you, I'm not looking for an interview. I would like to ask you a few questions about the last time you spoke with your husband after the landing. What about it? Well, this may sound strange, Mrs. Brubaker. Please don't be upset with me. Just before the conversation ended, Colonel Brubaker said to you something about going on a vacation, and your reaction was, it was like you didn't understand what he was saying. Why would you want to know about that? As I told you, it's something personal. It's personal to me, too. Please, I'm not trying to embarrass you or anyone else. Why would any of this be your business? Please, trust me. Why? You ask really good questions. Well, it's all so silly. It wasn't anything that dramatic. Brew just forgot something, that's all. I don't see the purpose in broadcasting that my husband made a mistake about a vacation when he had so many other things to think about. No, no, no. I'm not looking for anything to broadcast. What are you looking for? It has to do with a friend of mine. Is there something I should know? If there was anything, I would tell you. Well, it's nothing. Bruce said that he wanted to go back to Yosemite like last year. Last year we went to Flat Rock, not Yosemite. I don't think there's any cosmic significance in that. Mrs. Brubaker, I truly thank you. I'm sure you had better things to do than put up with a bunch of stupid questions. No, I didn't. Have I been any help to you at all? 
Well, I don't know. May I call you again sometime? Yes. Inside? Are you sure? Get more personnel. They can't go too far on foot. Piece of cake. Charles, cut it out. You know you're bothering her. I know you're bothering her, and she knows you're bothering her. If you want to stay in the pool, cut it out. Hi, Uncle Jim. Hello there, Charles. Just fine. Thank you. Can I offer you something to drink? No, thank you. How are the children? Fine. Charles is strong. It's very much to himself, but he's strong. Sandy doesn't know. Uh, there's going to be a memorial service on Tuesday, mm -hmm. right here in Houston. The president, the president will be here. He's going to speak. It's nice. Will I get a folded flag? I would like you to be there. Please. I, I know how difficult everything is for you just now. I feel like Jack the Ripper even asking you. It's just that it would be good for everyone if you could go with me to the service. It's a horrible way to die. No, oh, absolutely not. When the heat shield separated, it was over in less than five seconds. I know that sounds grisly. You, you just have to know that he never suffered. He died doing what he wanted to do. Something he felt was important enough to die for. 
I know, I know. I don't think it was important enough for him to die for. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I have no right to intrude on you like this. I'll call you tomorrow. Jim, I'll go. You're a very special woman. He was a very special man. Thank you. Hey, Uncle Jim? Yeah? My dad went to Mars. Yes, yes, he did. I'm dehydrating. Yes. He was alone. Which direction was he heading from the airplane? <sighs> Look south and west only. Call everybody off north and east. The other two are south and west. Hello again. Hello again. Can I offer you something to drink? Yes, thank you. What would you like? Some scotch straight, please. 
If you haven't found what you're looking for, you're embarrassed about bothering me again. However, there are one or two questions more you'd like to ask me. It's something personal, and you won't bother me anymore. I haven't found what I'm looking for. I feel embarrassed about bothering you again. However, there are one or two more questions I'd like to ask you. Something personal, and I won't bother you anymore. You're up to something. You want my help, and you won't tell me what it is. Why? You're a very smart lady, you know that. Yes. I drink too much. I get in trouble a lot because I talk too much. Sometimes I have an imagination that's a bit too vivid. Something's wrong, and I don't know what it is. Believe me, I would never do anything to harm you or your husband. I swear I wouldn't. What are you after? I'm taking a terrible risk telling you this. You may throw me out of here, and I do not want to be thrown out. I don't think your husband is the kind of man who makes mistakes, no matter how far away he may be. I think he was trying to tell you something. What? What did you do at Flat Rock? Nothing much. We came home after one day because Charles got sick. What did you do that one day? I don't remember. We took a tour of the town. They had those tours. And I, I don't remember. We, we took some home movies. Do you have them? Yes. May I see them? Yes. They were making a movie the day we were there. Brew got a big kick out of it. He never knew it took so much time to just do one simple scene. Charles loved that one. He wasn't in the greatest mood, though. He didn't know it, but he was sick. Brew was fascinated with the detail. He couldn't get over how something so fake could look so real. He kept on saying that with that kind of technology, you could convince people of almost anything. There's this guy, he, he takes a trip to Europe. Uh, it's his first vacation in a long time. He sees the sights, you know. Uh, he has a real good time. Anyway, after a while, he decides to call home. He gets his brother on the phone. And the guy says to his brother, how's everything at home? And his brother says, you, your cat died. And the guy says to his brother, you shouldn't tell me bad news like that. You should. The cat crawled out on the roof and chasing the squirrel. And got stuck. We had to call the fire department. And when they finally got there, the fireman crawled out. He grabbed the cat. But on the way down, he slipped and the cat fell to the ground. Ah! Ah! They had to take the cat to the vet. They tried to save the cat. They even operated on the cat. But it was too late. They couldn't save the cat. That's how you should bring bad news like that. So the guy says to his brother,
How's mom? And the brother says... She's on the roof! She's on the roof. <laughs> She's on the roof. Get it? Yes. Which one? What direction was he going? Rue Baker is going west. Put everybody west. Caulfield. Right now? Nice of you to join us here. Listen, I think I got something. You need a dermatologist? Don't tell me, I'll get it. Uh, George Raft, right? Where the hell have you been? I have to talk to you. I think I'm on to something. It could be your actual ball game. I mean it. Golly gee, Scoop, that sounds very interesting. Something's wrong, something big. They know I'm on to it and they try to kill me. Who's they? I can't tell you. Why not? You wouldn't believe me. You don't think so? Okay, listen to me. I got a tip from a friend, a good friend. Then he disappeared. He disappeared? like he never existed. There's some lady living in his apartment. His apartment is all different. She said she's been living there for more than a year. I checked the building rental office. They have receipts from her for more than a year. I checked NASA personnel. They have no record that my friend ever worked there. They say they never even heard of him. So this friend of yours who works at NASA gives you a tip and then he disappears. And it turns out that he never lived in his apartment. He never worked at NASA. And this is the guy that gave you the tip on your cosmic scoop, and you think I won't believe you? My car. Someone tampered with my car. The one you decided to go swimming with? They did something to it. I couldn't stop it. Can you prove that? Oh, the police said, uh, they said that nothing was wrong. And you think I won't believe you? Somebody took a shot at me. When? Yesterday. Thank God I've got an alibi. I'm telling you the truth. Listen to me, and listen good. I don't like you, Caulfield. You're ambitious. You think the way to get ahead is to come up with a scoop of the century. Woodward and Bernstein were good reporters. That's how they did it. Not by telling me they've located Patty Hearst three times like you did, or that brilliant piece of investigative journalism you pulled off by finding an eyewitness to the second gunman in the Kennedy assassination. The small fact that the man had been in a mental institution at the time never deterred you, not Scoop Caulfield. Well, most reporters are like me. They are plotters. They spend a lot of their time checking little things, like facts. They cover mundane stories like wars and trials and hearings. You never seem to have enough time in your busy schedule to stoop so low as to cover a story. You occupy your time with tips from people who never existed, driving your car into water and then claiming it wasn't your fault, getting shot at by unseen gunmen. Now, I really hate to interrupt your meteoric career with something so plebeian as a legitimate story. However, a trainload of propane gas had the bad taste to derail near Galveston, and there's a whole town that just might blow up. So it would be just really peachy of you if you would join your film crew that's waiting for you on the plane at this very moment while we speak. That was some speech. I thought so. I cannot go to Galveston right now. I don't think I heard you. Look, 
when a reporter tells his assignment editor that he thinks he may be onto something that could be really big, the assignment editor is supposed to say, you got 48 hours, kids, and you better come up with something good or it's going to be your neck. That's what he's supposed to say. I saw it in a movie. Get your ass on that plane. I can't. I have to follow this. And you can't tell me what this earth-shattering story is? It sounds too crazy. If I told you, I'd be in more trouble. You're not crazy. I'm crazy. I'm crazy for listening, and I'm crazy for saying what I'm about to say. I'll give you 24 hours to come up with something, not 48. I saw the movie, too. It was 24. moving an inch. Robert Caulfield? Yeah, who the hell are you? Federal agents. We have a warrant to search your apartment. You have a warrant? What for? Just don't move. I promise, just tell me what this is all about. Hey, come here, look at this. Could you come with me, please, Mr. Caulfield? Caulfield, I'm sorry. However, you're under arrest for possession of cocaine. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. You guys put it there. You know you did. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. I don't believe it. You put it there. Anything you say may be held against you in a court of law. You're part of all this. You mothers. How oh, that hurts. You don't have to put handcuffs on me. Please, Mr. Caulfield, these are serious charges against you. Don't add to them by resisting arrest. I don't believe... That hurts! I don't believe this. Well, hello there, Caulfield. So nice to see you. It's at this point that Alan Hill says to Richard Conti, Jimmy Stewart. Oh, yeah, Jimmy Stewart, thank you. Look, Scoop, I can't keep bailing you out of trouble. The front office is on my neck. I don't know how much longer I can keep them off, right? Right. Wrong. I got you out of there so as not to embarrass the network. I mean, you are a schmuck. I can't trust you to cover a fire. You'd probably fall down and get burned. You probably would be the cause of it. A company car, you're fired. Oh, I love how that sounds. I love that so much, I'm going to say it again. You're fired. You're through. Oh, I love it. It's not what it looks like, really. Frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn. You see, I told you, you tell me about the lonely plight of a dedicated journalist, I tell you to stuff it. You tell me about a meaningful relationship, I tell you to stuff it. You tell me you're in trouble, you're out on bail, you just got fired, I tell you I'll be right over. My head hurts. You look awful. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Did you find out what I asked? One o'clock in the morning, I get a call from an unemployed junkie to find out all of the military installations in a 300-mile radius around Houston, Texas. You certainly have a way with words. Did you find out? Yes, and it wasn't easy. It took exhaustive research. Well, I'm proud of you. How many? One. White Bluff. It's a SAC base. My father used to be stationed there. That's exhaustive research? At one o'clock in the morning, you call your father. That's exhaustive. White Bluff, that's too big. Too big for what? Too big for what I want. What do you want? I'm thinking of enlisting. They'll never take you. That's why I'm thinking of enlisting. You're on a story, aren't you? I was fired. You're on a story, and I'm helping you. This can't be happening. I really appreciate that. 
The only reason I'm doing it, considering your track record, whatever story you're on, will turn out to be garbage. You shouldn't mince words. I'll fit you some coffee, then you can jump me. There's no other one besides White Bluff? No. Except one abandoned base they used for training during World War II. Jackson. There's nothing there now. Don't you want to jump me? Of course I do. Where's Jackson? About 300 miles directly west. I think I'm going to get angry with you. You have any money on you? You want me to pay you? How much? About 100. Why don't I just leave it on the dresser in the morning? Give it to me now. <laughs> in advance? That's the height of conceit. Please, in your car keys. You're really being terrific. Why? You're not obnoxious when you're helpless. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Also, Liz Haller said you were super. Well, when I get back, we'll jump each other. Maybe. I'll get arrested again. It's a deal.
Morning. Morning. You in charge here? See that sign there? Yes. Well, read it. I did. Out loud. A and A Crop Dusting Service. You want to know who I am? I bet you're one of the A's. But which one? I bet you can't answer that question, smart ass. First one. Wrong! Can I have one more guess? You got it. The second one. <laughs> Wrong. I'm both of them. A and A. My name is Al Bain. Now, I got a son. You know, the other A was for him. But he don't like to fly. He became a lawyer. I think he's a pervert, so I took the A away from him. You want to speak to somebody in charge? You speak it to both of them. My name is Caulfield. Hey, I can't help that. Mr. Albain, how much do you charge to dust the field? $25. I'd like to hire your plane. That'd be $100. You said you charge $25. $25 to dust the field, but you ain't got no field because you ain't no farmer, which means you ain't poor, and I think you're a pervert. Okay, $100. $125. What? Because you said yes to $100 too quick, which means you can afford $125. And where do you want to go, smartass? I'm not sure. I'm looking for someone who's lost. Uh, your money. so I can see. Why didn't you sit in front? You know how to fly? No. And I got to sit back and you got to put your goddamn head down, smart ass. your friend doing out here? He's lost. He robbed a bank or something? No. Well, I get a third. What? We find him, I get a third of the loot. Now keep your goddamn head down. Over there. Where? Helicopters. 
I seen him fly around here last couple of days. Let's follow him. I would if I could see him.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Brubaker, Mrs. Willis, Mrs. Walker, my fellow Americans, I come here today to talk of unfinished hopes and of unfulfilled dreams. Charles Brubaker, Peter Willis, and John Walker left this earth for their dream a little more than eight months ago. They were never able to return to us. Their dream was able to grow and flourish because of the support of millions of citizens all across America. At a time when cynicism was a national epidemic, they gave us something to take pride in. It is a dream that should not be allowed to die. A nation is built on the spirit of its people. The test of greatness of any nation is how that nation pulls together in a time of crisis. The only limits on what we can achieve are the limits we place on our hopes. These three men reminded us of the limitlessness of our hopes. There was a moment these past few days when we were all one people. We were all hoping. We were all a little bit taller, a little bit prouder. We were all feeling the same fears and the same exhilaration. These three men brought us together. We knew together that there are no goals we cannot reach if we just reach for them together. There is no adequate way in which we can express our gratitude to the men themselves because they are no longer among us. However, we can serve their memory, what they stood for, what they stood for.